We're finally here. Arc 6. The arc all of you love to tell me about. It's nice to see you guys so excited about this arc though, and I'm really looking forward to getting into it. To those who have stuck around for the entirety of Arc 5, I really do appreciate your support. The arc kicks off with the crew leaving Pristella and heading towards the Roswell Mansion. We get some nice character interaction, and if you remember my comments in the Arc 5 Phase 1 video, I talk about how this is always great in these lulls in the story. Subaru and Julius talk, and Subaru is able to relate Julius' experience to how he himself views his relationships due to return by death. It's an interesting and also sad dialogue, and like I've said before, Subaru taking any time to reflect on RBD is always a great moment. When we finally get to the Roswell Mansion, God is it great. Roswell and Subaru have some of the best interactions in the series, as Roswell is an overwhelming presence whenever he is involved in a scene. He basically steals the spotlight, and in a singular conversation, Roswell uses Julius' desire to regain his name as a way to not only make fun of Julius for possibly putting up a front for his intentions, but to also put that thought in the Amelia Camp's head, all while criticizing Subaru and reopening old wounds. He is the GOAT. Almost every sentence this man speaks is includes Subaru's shade. There's almost a battle of rhetoric going on in front of everyone between Subaru and Roswell. Roswell points out that, strangely, Subaru is the only one who remembers a gluttony victim again. He points out that his existence sure seems like a special one, and he should treasure it. It's like he's digging directly into what happened with Subaru in Arc 4, and that, while Roswell is cooperative, he is still quite rhetorically hostile. Roswell then criticizes Subaru for putting selfish thoughts first and foremost, wanting to bring back Rem before bringing back all the innocent people lost in Pristella. Roswell knows how to hit Subaru exactly where it hurts. Subaru also later on accepts that him going instead of someone more capable is just his own ego and selfishness so that he can be the first person to see Rem wake up. Emilia actually speaks out against Roswell, showing some good progression thus far. She accepts that Subaru might prioritize Rem over her, and that's okay. She vows to wake up Rem and to instead bring back Subaru to her side rather than Rem's. Betty and Roswell then have a very cryptic conversation that ends up circling back to Subaru in taking the Witch Factors. Roswell is aware of it, and he knows he holds two of them. This conversation felt very implicit and nuanced, and I feel like I missed out on some of the deeper parts of it. The mansion scenes close out with them recruiting their mansion prisoner, Melee, to deal with the witch beasts of the sand dunes. And we can also notice that pretty much every time, the illustrator forgets that Subaru's hand is supposed to have dragon's blood. Before departure, we find out that Ram's missing horn actually has more consequences than we realized. It isn't just a lack of combat power, but that her body doesn't receive the amount of mana it needs for being an Oni. She is in pain and fatigue constantly. Her seemingly absurd decision to love Roswell doesn't just come from a place of being a servant or the lack of Ram, but from Roswell being the only person who can make her feel better. Ram specified that she will bring back the results that Roswell deserves. This brings up a new problem. What does Roswell want from the Sage? Something relating to Echidna, I presume. I suppose we'll find out eventually, but Arc 6 is off to a very interesting start. We see an immediate, selfish decision from Subaru embracing the greed of his own wants and desires. His actions will of course lead to an overall positive, but his intentions are still only surrounding Rem. He also has admittedly taken a spot that somebody much more capable could take, just so that he could be the first to see Rem wake up. Subaru and Amelia find themselves in a tavern just outside the sand dunes where a shopkeep urges them not to go, and warns of many witch beasts and of the Maya asthma or mana that was polluted by bad things. It functions just as mana does, but corrupt from the inside. Being surrounded by miasma is essentially the same as being in a wildfire, always taking in toxic particles. He also mentions how for about a year, birds have been flying towards the tower, Gee, I wonder what happened one year ago. One thing that I already love about Arc 6 is how strong the setup is. In hindsight, it feels like Arc 5 just sort of happened, whereas Arc 6 has tons of unresolved plot lines and details going into it, with lots of suspense about the sand dunes and the watchtower. The setup feels very focused, but my biggest problem with this phase is how the execution is very much unfocused. The pacing is very unfocused, and the structure is honestly some of the worst I've read so far outside of the Cursed Liliana chapters. And it feels like we're on a crazy roller coaster of death as we jump around in events rapidly, spending pages and pages going in depth about the gory details of death. On their way to the watchtower, they start setting up some ice towers to follow on their way back, which are being destroyed by the sage as they go. There's this dialogue from Beatrice that I felt like I should highlight, where she says, Piss, I suppose. They notice no matter how much they travel, the tower does not get closer. It's like a never-ending hallway. The further they go, the tower does not move an inch. They come to understand that the sand time that occurs in the sand dunes is responsible for their incapability of travel. And through fierce determination, they break through the sand time, and finally, the tower inches closer. Sand time itself is described as a trap made up of miasma. It makes me wonder if breaking through sand time is like getting randomly teleported around the sand dunes, or if it's something that can be controlled. We come across a sandworm, and then a courtesan bear. Courtesan is an interesting word to describe them, since it means a prostitute. The monster designs so far are super cool. I especially like the bear and one that is soon to come. Something agitates one of the ground dragons while Melee is moving the bears, and they're forced to run for their lives, until a light shines from the watchtower, and Subaru's dead. The path was almost too easy. They were handling the bears, they beat sand time immediately, I was almost starting to wonder if they were actually going to make it first try, then pop goes his head. His return by death did not take him far, however. It took him moments before the ground dragon set off the bears. He has a very similar, if not worse, amount of time that he had in arc 5. For the second time, Subaru had zero clue how he died. That's how fast he was killed by the tower 
and it made him feel like this was the first time he had ever wasted a turn by death due to the lack of information gathered. Super then proceeds to get pummeled from the tower again, and I must say that the deaths in text format just hit different. The intense descriptions, the intense feelings of people like Betty and Subaru as he dies in the sand, and his own inner monologue urging her not to cry as he can't even move his body, and all he can do is muster up an unseen hand to wipe her tears away. Do you remember how I said in Arc 5 that I always think every single time, how can it get worse than this, about ReZero? Well, here we are. Subaru is minutes away from an instant annihilation in a field of thousands of witch bears. When Subaru returns for a second time, he embraces Beatrice and tells her that he loves her, with what just occurred in the previous loop fresh in his mind. He also uses this to unleash the Unseen Hand now that he has a better understanding of the situation and what causes his deaths. An incredibly touching moment between the two, and I'm also loving the increased use of the Unseen Hand in Arc 6. I think it's one of the most interesting powers in the series, so the more Subaru gets to use it, the happier I am. The Unseen Hand is described as if it's almost sentient, and is described as being great for being summoned, but also that Subaru feels a sense of loss and there being a price to pay for calling upon its power. The fact that Subaru could come with a solution to the ground dragon's irritation even at a time like this, where they're surrounded by bears and minutes away from impending death, is a testament to his cool-headedness and intellect. He once again twists the idea of the Unseen Hand, an authority used only in his memories for death and destruction, but being utilized to previously save Amelia, and now to soothe a ground dragon and to wipe the tears off of a crying Bayako's face. Rarely is this power used for offensive purposes, but it instead exists under Subaru's hold as a tool to save people, similar to how the petal juice of old intended its function. After stopping the bear attack, Subaru calls for a retreat because of a gut feeling, and I love how people just trust Subaru's intuition now since he's been right about everything in the past. As they flee, however, the Watchtower begins to let off shots again, and this is when Subaru and Bayako show off their second ultimate move, EMT. It effectively works as an anti-magic shield, and everything that enters it just sort of stops working. I love how all of Subaru's magic uses are defensive. The narrative is painfully aware that he is not a fighter, so he just gets tools to help him survive or act as utility. The magic shield lets us see what the sage was attacking the Amelia camp with, and it's simply needles, or stingers, which is fitting considering that Shala comes from the constellation of Scorpio. After the group's successful escape, the sage steps away and mutters to herself, found him. The magic shield, however, ends up disrupting Sandtime's miasma-laden trap, and they rip the world around them and all get tossed around and separated. Subaru wakes up in a cave with Ram, Anastasia, and Patrache. They wander around for a while and come to a fork in the road. The right path was unanimously decided to be certain death, yet a part of Subaru was jumping for joy at that idea. He wants to reset again. Heading down the left tunnel, they feel a bit of heat until... Yeah. Uh, Subaru gets cooked. We get pages of explanation of him melting until he resets again and restarts in the cave. His save point has updated, and it brings back the question yet again of just how our save points determined. Subaru convinces the group to go down the right path instead this time, and they slowly get more and more tested with each other until we get probably the most fucked up chapter of the entire series, detailing the four of them all killing each other as they go mad from miasma corruption, ending off with Patroche crushing Subaru's skull. Extremely gory and depressing. Subaru resets once more and cannot get out of his mind what just happened. What he did to Ram, what they all did to each other. It sticks with him throughout this entire loop, and it reminds me of some early ReZero criticisms about how death never affects Subaru. Chapter 16 is Subaru fighting for his life after what happened. These all clearly destroy him in some way. In the current loop, they get to talk about how mana gets corrupted, and it's a very interesting question. Why is it that mana can be contaminated by the Witch of Envy? I have no theories about this, but assuming it hasn't already been answered later in Arc 6 or in Arc 7, make sure you post some more theories in the comments. They go down to the left tunnel again, and Subaru begins to recall the centaur's appearance and notices it doesn't have eyes, so maybe they can sneak past it. Surprise! It can use echolocation. Subaru is going through so much shit that he's starting to settle back into the idea of being cool with dying. Subaru of Arc 5 pushed on even after having his foot blown off, but in the fight with the centaur, he considers giving up until Ram says that Rem would cry if he were to die. He tries to use the unseen hand, but buckles under the pain, and he wrecks his brain thinking of options. And I believe that he was about to try out the authority of greed before Shala intervenes and blows the centaur to dust. Subaru passes out, and for the first time without a death, at least to my knowledge, he enters the Shadow Garden again. He states that he doesn't even have a body, and that Subaru does not know enough about Subaru to reproduce himself in this place. Whether this represents him losing himself in a micro or macro sense is to be seen, but Subaru now hears the voices of Petaljuice and Regulus in the Shadow Garden. Does that mean that Return by Death is the authority of Envy? His power has been referred to as an authority in the past, if I recall, so does this make him essentially the Sin Archbishop of Envy? He meets with Satella as usual and feels that intense love, and wakes up in the Watchtower they've been trying so hard to reach. Subaru confirms that everyone surprisingly made it here safe, and comes face to face with the Sage Shala herself. Not super impressed with her design just being 90% nudity, which is a recurring trend for the series, but I do find her color scheme sort of reminiscent of Subaru's tracksuit. Shala believes Subaru to be her master, and calls herself the Star Keeper of the Pleiades Watchtower. Is this due to Subaru's consideration as a Sage King? It? 
Is it due to his envy authority? I'm going to assume that this has spawned theories that Subaru has time traveled to the past before in some sort of big time loop, but I'm gonna go ahead and say no, and that plot lines like that usually end up pretty mediocre or flawed heavily. Shala's first words to Subaru is the word three, referencing the amount of witch factors he has of envy, sloth, and greed. The three stars of Beetlejuice, Regulus, and the star Subaru. If she is aware of and accepts these witch factors, there is something much more interesting going on here. Who would be the master to the sage? This question sent me down a rabbit hole of thinking for like half an hour. Would it have something to do with being isekai Then how do people get isekai Is it all relating to the Witch of Envy? If so, then why is Al here? Is he also a sage candidate? Does he also contain a return by death-like authority? If it's all about the Witch of Envy, then why would Shala so readily accept Subaru after determining he has the Envy Factor when her job is to watch over the Witch of Envy seal? Is it because Satella and the Witch of Envy are two different entities, and Subaru was chosen by Satella rather than Envy? We also hear about the Watchtower's trials, and I have no idea what to expect from these. I'm wondering why they have to undergo them if Shala is right here and believes Subaru to be her master. That's enough questions though, and this marks the end of phase one. Let's talk about some things I like and disliked about this phase. Number one, I love how much setup this arc has, and just how many underlying plot threads there are that push our characters into this hopeless scenario. Roswell and Subaru's interactions stole the show and remain a highlight of the phase. The increased use and recontextualization of the Unseen Hand is fantastic. Subaru inching closer and closer towards regression and a descent into madness is fascinating to read. The Shadow Garden scenes in the Sage are both incredibly thought-provoking scenes. I only have two cons for this phase. One, Shala's design is kinda lame. And two, oh my god, Zorbus. And two, the pacing is again a massive issue. Phase one felt all over the place and unfocused with random chapters dedicated to gore and violence or recounting things we already knew. There were times where this phase was hard to read due to the back and forth nature of it. There were not many light novel changes, not just for this phase, but for the entirety of arc six, but there are two worth noting. Number one, instead of them solving sand time immediately, it was much more of an ordeal and relied on Ram using clairvoyance on the aforementioned birds that fly towards the tower. And number two, the centaur death was cut, which I'm fine with because it felt a bit gratuitous without adding much, and instead they go down the right path first, to which the group comes across a bunch of walls that Subaru recognizes as doors. Subaru deletes the first three by touching them, but they become stuck on the fourth door. After this, the miasma death then occurs. Now, let's jump straight into my expectations for phase two and beyond. Number one, Subaru will fall pretty far mentally. Yeah, this is happening. Number two, Garfield's mother's memories are with Gluttony. Not yet, but maybe soon. There is a traitor. Nothing yet. There is something much more sinister going on with Al. Nothing yet, as he's not in the arc. The possibility of Subaru being isekai to assemble all the witch factors. No updates on this yet. However, there has been a much bigger focus on his assembling of them. Six, Sirius will escape. Nothing yet. Number seven, Petaljuice's spirit is a problem, nothing yet. Number eight, Shala will not take much convincing, yeah, apparently I was dead on about that. Number nine, Fox Echidna will lead to multiple problems, nothing so far, but I am keeping an eye on her. Number ten, more info about people beyond the Great Waterfall, nothing yet, we only just met the sage. Number eleven, Melee will be present in arc six, yep, pretty much immediately. And number twelve, Dragon's Blood Resolution, nothing so far, a lot of this stuff hinges on what happens with the sage. I'm also gonna throw up two new expectations on the board. Thirteen, the Shadow Garden will grow much more in influence, not only as time goes, but as Subaru acquires more authorities. He will materialize into it as he comes to understand himself as a person and what his role in the world is. And finally, number 14, Roswell has an underlying motive with Ram and the Sage. I honestly do not have any more. Phase 1 felt super all over the place and it was hard to pin down, but that'll be it for my Phase 1 video. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the YouTube algorithm. And down in the description, you can follow me on Twitter. Don't post about ReZero yet because I don't want to get spoiled, but I will eventually. And you can also join my Discord where we talk about MHA, ReZero, and Jujutsu Kaisen and stuff like that. And in the ReZero channel, I also live blog my thoughts as I'm reading. So if you're interested in that, please do join. And that's about it. Thank you for watching. See ya.